welcome everyone along today. It's good to see all of you again after five weeks for many of us not seeing each other. Did you, did you miss me? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, a lot of people didn't miss me. <laughs> no. we, uh, it's a bit warm in here if the aircon has gone off. I'll just uh, adjust them a little. Well, there's a few housekeeping things first that we want to talk about. And since we met you last, um, myself and Mary went straight from here down to Coffs Harbour on, uh, uh, what was that, that would have been like, couple of days before Christmas, I suppose. And uh, we stayed in Coffs Harbour for around four days and we met up with a group there. There were about 70 people there or so. And then we went from there um, on the day after, or well, no, Christmas Day actually, we travelled across to Armadale and we met up with around 50 people there. And then we travelled, I think it was a couple, a couple of days later than that, probably on the 27th or something, we travelled back to the Gold Coast and we met up with a group there. There were probably about 50 or so there at the Gold Coast. And then we travelled home. And in amongst all of that, uh, Mary and myself have had lots of stuff to do with, um, particularly with regard to lots of very negative projections coming from the spirit world and then those spirits influencing people on earth uh, and so getting lots of nasty emails and so forth and having to deal with that emotionally. So. Myself and Mary are a bit exhausted actually from dealing with all those projections and so and what, the end result of all of that is that uh, I haven't prepared anything to talk to you about today. <laughs> uh, so, so what comes up comes up. Um, but what I'd like to do is just uh, one fellow who uh, contacted us had some pageant messages in a, in a box that he'd stored for about seven or eight years and he'd heard that a group of people like yourselves were interested in reading the pageant messages so he decided to send it anonymously, he doesn't want to be known to you, he doesn't agree that I'm Jesus but that's immaterial, he still acted lovingly and he wanted to send uh, to you a box of free books that were, were done by somebody else in the States which are like an extract of different Paget messages, like it's a small, so instead of having the whole walking book of truths that you can hit somebody over the head with, <laughs> there's this shortened version, if you like, that he's got of the Paget messages, um, broken into subject order, basically, and subject material for somebody who just wants a shorter read. And so they are available for free up the back. I think half of them are already gone, or most of them are already gone. So you may see some of them up the back. Um, the man, uh, he actually asked us to cover over some things on the back, but I don't agree with doing that. Um, the man who wrote this, or who, he didn't write them, he actually just edited them, put them together, is a man in the USA who actually is very, very angry with me at the moment. So, um, so it's ironic that the person in Australia who gave us these books gave us the books of a person in the US who was very angry with me and only last week sent me a very nasty email. So, um, so as it's worked out, the actual, but the actual material in it obviously is just the pageant messages uh, located into specific order. So if you'd like to have a free one of those up the back, um, they're there, available. Thanks to the who wants to remain an anonymous, <laughs> right? So, uh, so it's great. It's called Celestial Messages. Um, yeah. And I'll just read the front too. It says, A chronicle of the progression and transformation of the soul from me to you, your beloved brother Jesus. <laughs> but anyway, it's, it's, uh, it's quite funny how... I, I won't talk about the email that I got from the same man, but uh, uh, it certainly wasn't very friendly. Um, so myself and Mary had, uh, have had many unfriendly <laughs> things happen <laughs> over the last fortnight, three weeks or so that we've had to work our way through to a degree and we're still feeling quite a lot of stuff from spirits and so that's uh, not really helped me in terms of getting to the place where I could think about something I wanted to talk to you about. So um, what I'm going to do is actually open it up to... Oh, there's one other announcement before I begin. And that is uh, tomorrow after the 
more, there's a session from one till three, right? And then we have a break normally. When we come back from the break tomorrow, there'll be just a 15 minute discussion about what's happening and what, uh, um, a bit of a summary about what's happening with regard to translation of the stuff into different languages. And uh, um, that I won't be presenting that, uh, Brian will be presenting that just briefly because he wants to coordinate it rather than have lots of individual people doing lots of things that means doubling up work and all that kind of thing. And because a lot of the work is happening by donation, obviously we don't want to waste people's time. So, so that'll be happening after the break uh, tomorrow's session. And there was one other thing too I had to say. About. Oh, yes, of course, very important. And I would just really like to thank all of those people who do prepare the venue for us and who like tidy up the venue on the Sunday evening for us. Um, they do that uh, through a free, the free donation of their time and, uh, and it's an expression of their love to you. So would you like to thank those people? Um, So I'd just like to thank you for doing that for us. So what subject would you like to talk about today? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, soulmates. Yeah. <laughs> so the over the overwhelming feeling is soulmates, is that okay, okay. Well I'll go along with you. And we'll talk <laughs> we'll talk about soulmates. Um, can I just ask the question though, why is that such an overwhelming thing to talk about for you at the moment? <laughs> <In me? laughs> We're needy for our soulmates, is that the, <laughs> okay. <laughs> well that's one of the things we'll definitely need to address <laughs> in the discussion. <laughs> All right. Um, well what I'm going to do first then is give you a little summary of the technicalities of soulmates and then we'll get into the emotions regarding soulmates. How does that sound? Um, it's important to understand the technicalities regarding soulmates, the real spiritual truth if you like, the divine truth about soulmates because it actually does affect a lot of your life without many people even knowing it affects their life. So that's why it's quite important to allow yourself to understand the truth about how the soulmate thing works. Because what I notice a lot of times is people think that you can choose your soulmate. You know, like, oh, that guy's nice and handsome and he's got a life, and he's, got, he's, got, he's quite wealthy, that's my soulmate, right? <laughs> or that girl's got a nice figure and you know, she's like pretty and whatever, that's my soulmate and it's not like that at all. And then a lot of us get into this state with God with regard to the soulmate issue because it's not like I'm choosing my soulmate, a lot of times we start feeling that we don't have free will. Do you see what I'm saying? Like your partner's already chosen for you, so does that mean you've got free will? And that's a question that people ask. You know, they say, "Oh, it can't be, it can't be uh, true because we all have free will, and so therefore it, it would break the law of free will. So therefore, this soulmate issue can't be true." Does that make sense? So a lot of times, uh, people, including my own mother, actually feels that way. So um, a lot of people have a lot of different emotional injuries regarding the soulmate connection, which, which we need to talk about. So let's look at it from a technical point of view in the first few hours or so, and then we'll go into the emotions of it all, because it's the emotion of it all that's very, very interesting. So let's start with God. Who has masculine and feminine qualities, and God creates souls that all have masculine and feminine qualities. So let's grab one of those souls over there, one of God's children. And what happens now, for this, I'm going to describe the place for the, the description of a heterosexual soul. But that doesn't mean that, uh, and by the way, there is no such thing as a heterosexual soul or a homosexual soul. There is just a soul that all has varying qualities of, ma ca of masculine and feminine characteristics. Now when the masculine characteristics become dominant, when, when the soul separates into the two halves, it separates into two male forms. If the feminine characteristics are dominant, 
then when the soul separates, the it'll separate into two female forms because the feminine characteristics are dominant. But for many souls, there's a huge range of masculine and feminine characteristics. If you draw a standard distribution curve about the issue, and let's say this is masculinity and this is femininity, right? you can see that like 80 or 90%, whatever it is in the standard distribution curve, fit between there, they will be, they will be called, when they, when they incarnate, you could say they will be heterosexual, right? That's not how you spell heterosexual either. But anyway, it's hetero, et, right? And obviously on the male dominant side in this area here, the souls that incarnate there are going to be masculine, male-based homosexual, right? And obviously the souls that incarnate that have a dominant of female characteristics with some, still got male characteristics of course, but they will have, they will separate into, you could call it female homosexual, couldn't you? All right. Notice it doesn't give any room for bisexuality, which is a very confronting thing for most people nowadays. Because the bisexuality movement, if we could call it that, is growing in its intensity. And it, and it comes from a confusion of our own sexual attractions. And, and one of the things I'd like to talk about today is how our sexual attractions become so confused. Because the truth is that we can actually be a heterosexual soul but in a homosexual relationship and feel quite comfortable until we start opening the soulmate part of our soul. And I want to talk about that too, what that means to open up the soulmate part of your soul. We well, you can also be in a homosexual, uh, sorry, a, a heterosexual relationship and be quite comfortable but actually be gay. You can actually be homosexual in those relationships and this is why many grow up in a heterosexual relationship. They get to a certain point in their life where they're starting to connect to their emotions and feelings and now they realise actually that they're not attracted to males or females, the opposite gender, but now they're attracted to the same gender. There's a reason for that and that is usually they're more connected to their own emotions as they're getting a bit older for many of these people and they start realising that the soulmate part of themselves has actually got this attraction. Now the key is with all of this is God designed us in such a way that there is this huge variety of, if we could call it sexuality, or gender bias, there's this huge variety of gender bias inside of anyone, inside of the souls of, of, of all of us. So some of us will have dominant masculine characteristics, some of us have dominant feminine characteristics, and there'll be this huge variety anywhere in between that. Just like there's a huge variety with music. Some of you feel like you're tone deaf and you can't sing at all, right? And others feel like totally musical. They just pick up a musical instrument, any musical instrument from any age and away they go and play it. How did that happen? Well, that happened through a whole variety of different characteristics that come. So God's created this whole variety of characteristics in this soul. And what we're doing when we're talking about the soulmate discussion is we're focused primarily on the intergender or the sexual characteristics of the soul, if you like. Does that make sense? But in reality, the soul has lots and lots of characteristics and attributes. And by soul, I'm talking the whole soul here, not one half of the soul, which you are. I'm talking about the combination of the two halves. Because remember, how God sees you, actually, is not how you're currently seeing yourself. How God sees you is as this one soul even if you're in two different physical forms. And when I say two different physical forms, once you incarnate, your half of the soul is attracted to a physical form and a spirit body form, and the other half of your soul is attracted to a different spirit body form and a different physical body form. But from God's perspective, you are still one soul. Does that make sense? Ask questions away, by the way. And microphones, if we could have one over here. If you leave your hand up so that, that's it. Um, 
So does that mean one person's soul can only progress so far? Like just say one person reaches the seventh sphere and the other person refuses to do anything, mm -hmm. that then one person can't go on until the other person starts to move on? Um, it does mean it to a degree, but if I can describe where it stops for one person, you remember you've got the first sort of one to seven spheres? And then you've got the transition into at one minute, which is the eighth sphere, and then you've got many other spheres up above. And then we've been calling the 22nd sphere, the transition between the 21st and 22nd sphere is a state of at one minute of your own soul. When you're progressing as a half of a soul, you can progress right up to the 21st sphere. But you won't be able to make the transition into the 22nd sphere without your soul mate. Does that make sense? So you can actually be at one with God while your soulmate is down in the first sphere somewhere. Now, at, in a state of at one with God, obviously you're in a state of bliss. So, so even if it took a thousand years for him to get to where you are after that point, it doesn't matter too much to you. Does that make sense? But you will always be longing to progress once you, once you connect with God and you're, progress, you're progressive on the divine love path you'll always have a desire or a longing to progress. But you'll be able to continue doing that right up to this point here, but you won't be able to go through the soul union process without your soulmate also being in that same location. But this is one thing I'd like to talk to you about, about soulmates. As the soul progresses, as one half of the soul progresses in love, the amount of pull that they have to the other half of the soulmate is so great, it's actually the biggest pull that you'll ever have or the biggest traction you'll ever have to any other person aside from God in your entire life. Right? And that pull draws your soulmate into your life no matter where they are. Whether they're in spirit or they're on earth, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where in the spirit world they are, you will draw them to you at some point. Does that make sense? And that's the thing is God designed it in such a way that there's... a you could think of it like a magnetic attraction between the two halves of the soul and that magnetic attraction intensifies as one half of the soul grows in love. It, it's not very strong when both halves of the soul are not very grown in love, but as one half of the soul grows, then that attraction intensifies. We'll talk more about that, uh, the emotion of that, uh, as we come up. Matt? How you doing? Good. Around about... What sphere would you need to be in to have the identity of your soulmate truthfully revealed to you, do you think? In the spirit world, uh, normally that happens around the fifth sphere of the spirit world. It's not so much where you, you need to be, it's what state you need to be in as to when it's revealed to you. You see, for many of us, many of us have a lot of emotional injuries about having something determined for us. And when you think about it, it's the soul, which is the complete soul that has free will, not each half. All right? now God gave free will to the complete unit. Right? So if one half of the soul is really progressing and draws the other half into their life, the other half may think, I don't want to be drawn into their life. Why do I keep getting drawn into their life for? Well, it's, part, it's their soul that's drawing them together, their own soul, and they just don't realise that, you see. And so we can't actually say that the two halves of the soul have complete independent free will. It's the complete soul itself that has free will, that's independent of every other being on the, pla on the planet and in the universe and even independent of God's will. That's what free will is. It's the complete independence. But it's the complete independence of the entire soul, not its two halves. So, in terms of when you would find out about who your soulmate is, that completely depends upon whether you're opening up the half of your soul towards the other half. In other words, opening up this electronic, if you like, or this magnetic connection between the two halves. If you open it up, and the way it's opened up is emotional, it's not opened up in any other way, once you start opening it up, what happens is that your soulmate starts getting drawn to you, and at that point you're also 
usually able to know who your soulmate is. So you could be in the first sphere of the spirit world and learn who your soulmate is. Or you might be a celestial spirit and first learn who your soulmate is. There's many spirits who have become celestial spirits and who didn't know who their soulmate was until after then. Right? So it just depends on whether that part of your soul has opened up or not. Now obviously it needs to be opened before you become a, a one with God. So there's many seven, seventh sphere spirits, I should clarify, who haven't found out who the soulmate is, but by the time they enter the celestial realm, they do know who their soulmate is. And, and the longings for your soulmate vary too, by the way. Obviously, if I have more emotional injuries towards the opposite gender and my soulmate happens to be a member of the opposite gender, how much of a longing am I going to have for my soulmate? Not very much, right? But if I am very open and I've started to deal with a lot of my emotional injuries about the opposite gender, I'm going to be much more open to understanding, oh, that person is my soulmate. So it just depends on my emotional openness. And we'll talk about how to emotionally open that part of your soul to the gender that is your soul mate. AJ, if you are with somebody that you believe is your soulmate, but mm -hmm. they're actually not, mm -hmm. does that shut off the connection to draw your yes. true soulmate to you? Of course. Yeah. That makes sense, doesn't it? So yeah, well, sorry. Go on. I, I was just going to say, I guess as we work through our injuries, then yep. it will feel like it's not right anyway. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So there was a time in my life where I believe one person was my soulmate for nearly seven years. And while I was believing that, that I'm totally shut down to my real soulmate. Yep. So she's never going to come into my life in that regard, in that place. As soon as I went through the emotional injuries, I woke up one in the middle of the night. Ah, she's not my soulmate. And it just like dawned on me. And then I had to look at why, why did I want her to be? Does that make sense? Like, so there's a lot of emotional injuries in that as to why you want somebody to be your own soulmate and you're not open to your own soulmate. So for me it was a lot of grief that I had to work my way through after that yeah, as a result of that realisation. But we'll talk about the emotions involved in it as we go along. Mm -hmm. right? And somebody else, uh, Jenny, had a question over there, up there? We can go up there first and then down there. So it could be almost negative if you think somebody is your soulmate and it could be just you're attracted to them because you have, they're making you feel good because they're making you feel good in your um, comfort space. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about how that will happen in a minute when we talk about our, our addictions to the opposite gender. Mm. Um, if I progress in love on, on earth, mm -hmm. Um, my soulmate is there. Mm -hmm. Does it also automatically pull this? Or does it only happen in the spirit world? No, it happens on Probably earth. Probably earth as well. Yep, yep. And you'll feel drawn even as you grow yourself, you'll feel drawn into making decisions and choices that lead you to where your soulmate is. Mm. So let's say your soulmate's decided to go and live in Canada, right? And you both were born here, let's say, but your soulmate decided to go and live in Canada. Maybe when they were a child or when their parents uh, decided or, or maybe they just met somebody up, followed them over to Canada and they're still there, right? Mm. Then what will happen sooner or later is you'll be drawn to go to Canada. Mm. You'll feel like, oh, for some reason I just feel like Canada is the way to go. <laughs> you know, some place, and, and a lot of times it's some place way, way out that you'd never even consider normally and these kind of decisions often lead you to your soulmate. And this is where we want to talk a little about the law of desire. Now there's going to be a talk at some point about the law of desire completely, but part of finding your soulmate is about following your own desires. Because remember, if your soulmates, your own desires at some point are probably going to match the desires of your soulmate, which actually leads you together anyway. So we need to talk about that too. So anyway, we've, so can you see firstly though that we need to focus on the fact that we are one half of the soul. That's very important to understand. I am just one half of my soul. Right? There's, a, there's another person, my soul mate, who is the other half of that soul. 
we are one soul expressing itself in two different forms, right? The masculine in our case and the feminine form. Right? And we need to remember that because it's that entire soul that has free will. And when you go through the process of a soul union, you, st you come to understand how important it is that the entire soul has its free will rather than just its two the two halves. Right? Because it's that entire soul that God created in the original form that has the most power. It's also that entire soul that can grow beyond the condition of atonement to God to the condition of atonement with each other and even beyond that condition as far as it is known can grow beyond that condition. And the power of the soul in this union, unified state is much greater than the power of its two halves. Right? And that's why it's very important to understand I am just a half. Um, I was just wondering, say, if your soulmate was a murderer and had murdered someone, mm -hmm. um, there's obviously a penalty on that person's soul for repentance. Does that soulmate also attract that injury? No, um, it doesn't attract the inju it injury because the, in the way the injury enters the soul is via the, the connection points, and we'll talk about this in a minute, the connection points are all related to the bodies while they're connected to the physical form. So the way energy or emotions and experiences enter you is through the spirit and physical bodies, right? And enter the half of the soul. It's only when the half of the soul starts opening up towards the other half of the soul that they'll start feeling emotions coming from the other half of the soul. Now when that starts happening, then you will start feeling whether the person's a, you know, has murdered somebody or they've harmed somebody or you know, you'll start feeling the other half, the characteristics of the other half of your soul, whether those characteristics are actually what you would classify as like loving or unloving. So this is part of the problem is we start opening up to the other half of our soul, then we feel a bit creepy, right? Then what you're going to be tempted to do? Start closing down towards the other half of the soul, right? Because you feel that instead of just allowing yourself to feel those emotions because it's the allowance of those emotions that actually triggers your soul mate into experiencing the reasons why they did things. And we'll talk about this relationship between the two halves as we go through the talk today. It's very important to understand that there is this synergy of emotional expression that goes on between the two halves whether you are aware of it or not. All right? And for most of us, we're not aware of it. But it does happen. And the more you become aware of it, the more you can feel this relationship going on. Does that make sense? Yep. All right. So, so we're in the spirit world before we came to earth. Um, we, at this point, remember, we did not have any consciousness of ourself. So we didn't know who we were. So there was no self-consciousness, no self-awareness, if you like. This is before we incarnated. There's... Obviously, we don't know how to use our free will. So basically, it's like we have no free will at this point in the sense that, in the sense that we don't know how to use it because we don't even know who we are yet. Right? We also have, uh, before we incarnate, no, no memory of that state because we're still not self-aware. Self memory comes with self-awareness. So we're in this state... You could say we're in this created state as a unified soul, but we are yet to incarnate onto the planet to begin the process of self-awareness, to begin the process of getting to know ourselves, or as they call it in the pageant messages, as we call it there, the process of individualization. Individualization. In other words, becoming an individual. Now, the instant you incarnate, one half of the soul starts becoming the individual and the instant the other half of the soul incarnates, the, that's when the whole soul now is starting the process of becoming an individual. And you finish the process of becoming an individual when you make the unification in the 20-second sphere state. Right. So you can see the first time you incarnate, if you're conceived and, and, and from that moment on you've become an individual, right? 
and then that process ends, if you like, or is realized in its completion in the 20 second sphere state. So right now, none of you have yet learned how to become an individual. <laughs> Does that make sense? And the process of what we're going through is learning how to be an individual, not as a half of an individual, by the way, but as the entire soul. Remember, it's the entire soul that's individual. So what happens after that point is we are conceived. When we're conceived, obviously the soul splits into its two halves and the first half attracts a bodies that have been created for it through the sex act of the parents. And then eventually the second half, due to the law of attraction, the second half floats around the first half until the second half also has the opportunity to incarnate into a different form created for it. So this is why many times soulmates happen to be from the same country. Right? Because there is a very, very strong attraction between the two halves of the soul right from the moment of separation. Given that the souls are attracted to one another, what happens when a soul incarnates and it's aborted miscarriages or dies and goes to the spirit world while the other half has still not incarnated? Does that affect anything? Uh, no, there is, still the, the still, there is still the impetus to incarnate that has to occur for individualisation. Sure, but is it likely to choose a situation where it won't live very long or an unwanted pregnancy or something like that? That depends on the personality. Remember, the personality of the soul is something that God has already created, right? And that we come to realise. So that depends on the personality of the soul in the end. So it just depends on how the unincarnated soul responds to the death of the incarnated soul. And that, of course, is going to be very different depending on which, which, what type of personality we have. Sorry? But Mary, what do you want to say? You've got a microphone over there, by the way. It can't choose, though, can it? No. Would it, ha would it, would it have, have a feeling? An, it would have a feeling. Would it have yeah. a consciousness that the other half? Not a consciousness of the feeling. But just. But yeah. a feeling. Okay. Because gotcha. remember, it can't have a consciousness of a feeling until it has self awareness. Right? The soul still has feelings, but it's just not conscious of those feelings in the unincarnated state. As soon as it incarnates, it now is conscious of the feelings that it's having. Now, when we first incarnate, we're often. the consciousness is growing. So the moment of conception there are feelings that the soul starts absorbing from the parents and from the environment and the consciousness of those feelings grows. So there's feelings absorbed and we become conscious of what those feelings are. And that process of consciousness keeps growing all through your life. It doesn't stop when you become 12 or 15 you know, and set up a relationship or something. It, it grows all of your life until you become at one with your soulmate in the 20 seconds for your state. So the consciousness or awareness of your part of your soul and what's happening with the other part will continue to grow from the moment of conception right the way through to the moment of unification. And it will grow exponentially through that time. Every new sphere, you get a lot more consciousness of what's going on with the other half of your soul. Now everyone's cold, eh? Um, can somebody just turn, off the butt, uh, turn them off up there? And, uh, and we'll just keep an eye on the temperature. So just off and... Because uh, I've already said it, 26. And there's one back a bit too, Josh. Um, there's one... Uh, there's another one up the back there. Um, Jen, thanks. Oh, sorry. Um, you got the mic down there. Yep. Uh, how likely is it for soulmates to come from different countries? Is it possible and why would that happen? Well, in today's environment, it's highly likely. Like, because there's so much travelling going on, isn't there? And, you know, like, let's look at different scenarios. Right? A couple get together on their, you know, they get married. Where do they go for a honeymoon? Oh, Thailand. Let's go to Thailand for a honeymoon. So they go for a Thailand, Thailand honeymoon and, like, within three days they're pregnant, right? 
So where's the soulmate going to come from? Now, if it's the second half of the soul, right, that's incarnated into that pregnancy, then might, the first half of the soul might be in Thailand. And then the people come back to Australia with their newborn child, or, or conceived child initially, nine months later, newborn child. And where's the child in Australia? But the soulmate's in Thailand. That could easily happen, could it not? So can you see with travel and all these kind of things, um, we can conceivably be all, all over the world with regard to where we are and where our soulmate is. And so then the next question comes from that, doesn't it? How in the hell do we find them then? <laughs> and it's really easy to find your soulmate. So we need to talk about that. And that's part of this, emotion, this discussion that we have. But remember, I'm talking about the technicals first. And then we'll talk about the, the emotions of it next. Can we have the mic over, over here? Thanks. Sorry. Oh, go ahead, Jen. Once. So how does the time factor factor into all of this? in that between Graham and I, there's five years difference. Yep. So, like, how does earth time and spirit time factor into all of the incarnation Well, there's, there's no time in the spirit world, obviously, so it doesn't matter to an unincarnated spirit, particularly the fact that it's got no self-awareness. It doesn't matter to an unincarnated spirit that, it, that, it's, that it's got a time frame, right? But because of the first incarnation of the first half of the soul, the second half of the soul is going to have an even stronger inclination to incarnate. And because of that, I personally have not met any soulmates that have been apart for any longer than around 30 years in terms of their incarnation period. Now, I've met in 2,000 years a lot of soulmates, obviously. So, but in terms of 30 Earth years, difference in time. But it is conceivable that somebody could be longer than that. Does that make sense? It is possible. Um, and it's possible that it could even span generations, but it's highly unlikely for a soul to remain unincarnated in the spirit world. And I've never personally seen it, even though it's possible. So wh why? Why the difference in time? Is there a reason that there's a time difference or a strength in one half coming first and then the other one following? Is there any... Or there is are, there are so many different factors involved. Well, you think about how our personalities are so different. <coughs> Excuse me. Every single person in this auditorium is so different from each other, aren't we? Like, you meet somebody and you can realise there's some similarities, but, wow, there's also these wide differences, isn't there, in all sorts of factors of our personality. God's created all of us in such a different state personality-wise that it's so, there are so many variable factors that depend upon the incarnation of soul. Right from how many opportunities are there to incarnate, because you remember way back at the beginning there, would have been, there, are, there were less people on the earth, so therefore there were less opportunities to incarnate for a greater number of people. Does that make sense? And so obviously the time difference between the two halves may have, may have spanned 30, 40, 50 years easily in that state. Mind you, back then men also lived longer. So, and then, we de then the human soul degraded in its condition right down to some people only lived 20 years. Now, of course, there might, be t there might be, you know, so they might not have even found each other in their incarnate form if, if people only lived 20 years uh, lifespan due to their emotional injuries. So can you see there's just so many variable factors? The key to understand that is in the end, you're always going to meet your soulmate, whether it's here or in the spirit world, you're always going to meet them. But the chances of you meeting them are much greater if you open up the soulmate part of your soul. And we'll talk about that in the emotional discussion. Does that make sense? Um, uh, going back to uh, the personality of the soul, yep. um, as an unincarnate soul, yep. then would the gifts and the personality and potentials of that soul are the same for two of them? Or would they, would they have, for example, if you had one, uh, the gift of um, artistic gift, mm -hmm. Would that artistic gift be in both when they incarnate or would some get just like genetics, like one would get some and one wouldn't get any or how? 
Well, again, that varies very much between each individual soul. How the soul itself splits in its characteristics and attributes is an individual process for each particular soul. So, for, but you will find that there is a, always a generally a correlation of desires between the two halves. So let's say one of the part of the soul is, is passionate about music and so they get into guitar and, and away they go with that and you know, they do all of that kind of stuff. Then there's a higher likelihood that the other half of the soul is also going to have some kind of passion for music as well. Does that make sense? Mm. Um, and that eventually is found. But a lot of times our passions get stomped on from our childhood onwards and so we don't know our passions until we start freeing up our emotional state. And so that person may not have realised that passion yet. And so this is why it's very hard to judge from an imperfect state where we're not yet very developed in love that our soulmate would have a certain thing or characteristic because we ourselves, because of the development in love, may not easily recognise the, the characteristics even that we have within ourselves, let alone the characteristics of our soulmate. Mm. But yes, the personality is for the entire soul and how the personality splits between the two halves is very, very dependent upon how God created that soul in its split. From an energetic perspective, if you can think of it like a, big, a soul like a big bull, if you like, in it, of energy, with all this electrical energy going between the two, and then it separates, but all of these electrical lines, if you like, or energetic lines are all still going between the two halves. Now, obviously, there's going to be a very much a synergy between the two halves in terms of their desires, passions, longings, intentions. Lots of different parts of the soul are all going to have very similar na uh, natures, if you like, invo involved in that. And so, obviously, that connection is maintained throughout your entire development as long as you are staying in touch with your emotions, your desires, your passions, your longings. The more I detune from my emotions and passions and desires, the more I also detune from my soulmate. So if I'm very intellectual, very shut down emotionally, I am going to actually be pushing away my soulmate because I will not even be able to usually recognise my soulmate in that state because I, I'm not having that connection to myself. And remember, a connection to yourself is also this, similar to a connection to the other half of yourself. Because your soulmate is your other half of you at the emotional level. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that, but intelligence wouldn't be, you know, what, uh, is intelligence something that comes in with the soul as well? With the, you know, intelligence is, is vastly controlled by emotional injuries, right? So. And, many, um, and you'll see this more and more. As people grow in the spirit world, they become more and more intelligent and they become less guided by the emotions that shut down intelligence. So how many of you hate mathematics? Right. About half, maybe a bit more than that of the audience, right? Okay. How many of those people who hated mathematics were no good at mathematics? Ah, isn't that interesting? Almost all of them, all right? Now, can you see the relationship between that? There is an emotional relationship between the fact that we dislike something and that we're no good at it. Right? And the same applies to all forms of what we now classify to be intelligence. There is always an emotional reason why we get shut down in our intelligence. And so many of the people who you judge as not very intelligent actually have, have quite a few emotions that have caused them to shut down their intelligence. Because actually God created the soul with very powerful intelligence. But it's all emotional, and this is why when we get the emotional damage, the intelligence often gets shut down as a result. Also, there is this multi-generational injury that occurs where intelligence is glorified and emotional intelligence is denigrated. You notice that? Isn't that still really the case? How many times do you go along to a university course teaching you to be emotionally intelligent? <laughs> Not very often, right? But you do have lots and lots of university courses on all sorts of things, how to become a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer, a 
right? And all of these other things too, like psychiatrists, psychologists. And how many of those things talk about emotional connectiveness? Well, you can go along and even be a psychologist and still not learn about that, right? So there is this really big focus today on the intellect, which actually, in most cases, doesn't connect to people who have been shut down intellectually at a young age due to emotional injuries. And we then judge those people as they're not very intelligent, when in reality, the potential of their intelligence is just the same as our own. Right? So the truth is that your soulmate may appear in initially to be quite unintelligent, if you are intelligent, but as they grow and connect to their emotional reasons why they had that belief of themselves and release that, their intelligence will grow as a result. Does that make sense? Yeah. So again, why judge your soulmate based on intelligence? You, can you see how a lot of times our judgments are based around the emotional impact of the emotional injuries we receive rather than the truth? So when it comes to visiting or seeing your soulmate, you're going to have to be very open emotionally to your soulmate potentially being anyone. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Hi, AJ. Um, what would the complications of um, in vitro fertilisation with not knowing who the donor would be, how would that pan out? Anything that happens at the physical level is immaterial from this perspective. Well, when you said that the, the, um, the parents would, through their emotions, mm -hmm. um, attract that soul, so there's two parents, what about the parent of the... Well, obviously the parent of the genetic donor has... There's the genetics coming from that parent, and those genetics have emotional... Uh, things that created them, right? So obviously the emotional things that created the genetics that were then <laughs> given to the donor ha will have an effect on the child. Does so would the but emotional... But how does that affect the soulmate? Well, well, yeah. It doesn't really, does it? Well, yeah, I, wonder, I wondered a... how the connection, the, if there was an emotional connection between the donor and the parents and then... If there was a complication further than that, I didn't know. No. The way God's created it is if somebody incarnates, so whether they do it in vitro or whether they do it, you know, as an employee or any other way, the way when they incarnate, they still absorb emotion from their environment just the same as before. Part of that emotion is the genetics from the previous history of, of emotions of previous generations and so forth. But that has no effect on who your soulmate is in the end. So right? it's quite simple, still quite simple. It's still very, very <laughs> simple. No matter what man does regarding this issue, like man could actually genetically clone you and actually clone you into another living person and you're going to be very different because the two halves of your soul are going to be very different. Right? And they're going to be completely two halves of completely different souls with completely different personalities. You, it's the same with twins, right? Twins are incarnated into the same cell even, right? In terms of the, you know, the way the cell starts breaking up. If the twins are incarnated once they start splitting into the two different forms. They're very close to each other genetically, but have you ever met any identical twins that are identical emotionally? No, right? They have many identical feelings based upon their genetic imprint, their, their um, emotional imprints from their environment, but they are very, very different. My own daughter is a genetic, uh, is a twin, a, uh, an identical twin this, in this incarnation, and she is very, very different from her twin, which is who is in the first incarnation. Does that make sense? <laughs> My own daughter from the first century, Sarah, reincarnated onto the planet. And she is a twin of somebody who incarnated in the first incarnation. Is it all getting too complicated? <laughs> in other words, she's reincarnated, but her sister is not reincarnated. But they are identical twins, physical, physically, but very, very, very different emotionally. Right? So what happens at the physical level is almost immaterial to this discussion. 
Does that make sense? And this is the thing we've got to get away from, you see. We're constantly focused on, oh, yeah, there's two men there and they're attracted to each other. Isn't that bad? Like we have all this judgment about homosexuality, right? God doesn't have any judgment about that. God's got the two halves of the soul perfectly designed. All he cares about is what happens at the soul level. He's created this beautiful way of incarnation to learn about ourselves. Everything happens perfectly. And the only time it doesn't happen perfectly is when the environment has all of these emotional damage that gets then put onto that child, onto that younger soul, if you like. That's when imperfections arise. So that's when we have things like gender, body, mutation type things occurring because of the huge impact of emotional injuries that we have about sexuality here on the planet, where people want to become transgender, for example, right? because of huge emotional things that have been input, put upon them by their environment. <coughs> Because from, from, from God's perspective, all of us would know exactly what our gender attraction is, whether it's male, female, doesn't matter whether we're male or female, our, our attraction to be male or female, and we'll know specifically what it is, and we'll know that it will not waver once we know. Before that time, you might cycle between being like bisexual or going to a male or going to a female sexually or whatever, but as soon as you open this soulmate part of yourself, you will know for certain what the other half of your soul is in terms of its gender. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so remind, remember, physical things here, not really very important. Ah, none of you believe that. <laughs> Go on. Just while you're on the subject of identical twins, yep. a friend of, really good friend of ours is an identical twin, mm -hmm. and um, his brother actually, well either, either or of them, one of them can hurt themselves and the other one will actually feel the pain. Can you explain how that happens? Uh, it's very easy to explain. One day you will hurt yourself and your person sitting next to you will feel some of the pain. You see, when we're connected emotionally to everyone closely, we feel the pain that is in everyone closely and so therefore we don't want to create their pain anymore. You see, the more we become at one with each other, the less desire we have to act out of harmony with love with each other. And, and that's all even it. if we're not in the same room or exactly. in the same area? Exactly. Okay. So your soul is just as capable as an identical twin of experiencing that. The only reason why an identical twin experiences it and you do not at this moment is because they grew up in the same womb, usually in the same environment, in the same emotional environment, and so therefore they have a stronger bond to their own harm. In the end, all of you are going to have this bond to anybody's harm on this planet. So do you think you're going to want to hurt somebody after that? No. no. So that's how God created it. That's when, when I, for those of you who come from a re Christian religious background, when I said in the first century, I want my friends to become at one with me just as I'm at one with God, what I meant was that we would be at one on this level where we would notice each other's pain so much we would never want to create pain in the other. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, and I'm talking not about the pain of uh, finding out the truth, I'm talking about the pain of not living in the truth, the pain of error. I would never want to project error upon you because I could feel the pain that you would feel as a result of it. And in fact, God created your soul in such a way with the law of compensation that any pain you create in another is automatically placed upon your own soul. Yes. That's what the law of compensation is all about, right? So every single soul has that capacity like a genetic, like an identical twin. Thank we you. just are not aware of it because we are so separated emotionally from every other person on the planet until we become at one with God that we're not aware of that connection of existing. Do you follow? Yeah. We can go to yourself and then down to Alex. Just while you're talking about the physical, yep. what, what happens when, um, you know, there's a car accident and then the organs are actually put into other people mm -hmm. and they can actually take on some of their characteristics. What's happening there? What's happening there is the spirit who those organs belong to when the spirit was alive on earth is now influencing the person who is the donor, the, 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 who, who um, was donated to, the, the organs were donated to. Can you see that? Yeah. So they actually take on much of the personality traits sometimes, if, particularly if they're very mediumistic, they'll take on a lot of those traits because there is a strong bond established through the donation between the two people. 
So you imagine for a moment you lost your life and you had your heart was good after that, uh, you had a liver that was good, a kidney that was good and quite a number of other organs that were good, right? You would be quite interested, would you not, in where those organs went, don't you think? <laughs> right? And so, and this is if we didn't know we'd do all these things, we would be highly interested probably of all the, where they were, all went. And then if they went into someone you really liked and you could really connect with, you'd probably want to hang around them a bit, wouldn't you? Can you see that? And this is how this kind of things happen. There is actually a movie uh, with Minnie Driver in it. Have you seen that movie? Where, I won't tell you the whole story actually, it's just, I can't remember the name of the movie though. Um, where this happened, where one person died and it was given, the organ was given to another person and then that person felt influenced to contact the husband of the original person. And you can see why that would occur, couldn't you? Because the, the person who's passed would want that to occur, set, can even set that up if they liked the person who their organ was donated to. Lots of stuff happens like that, yeah. Where the Heart Is, is that what it's called? Something like that? Oh, no, no, no. Where the Heart Is is another movie. Yeah, no, sorry. I, I remember where the heart is. That's not. I think it's called Return to Me. Return to Me. Yeah, Return to Me, if you want to watch that. But that's a, that's a movie about basically that happening, although it, it's about the happening of it without the explanation of how it happened, of course. Yeah. Yep. We go across to Alex. Um, AJ, what you were saying previously about the physicality not really coming into it. Yep. I actually had an experience um, about four days ago. Um, it was pretty far out. <laughs> Um, Monique and I were just sitting in the camper van and we were just staring at each other. And um, it was the most incredible, intense feeling I've ever had in my life and yep. I can't compare it to anything. Yep. Um, it was like there was no time, no space. I had no sense of myself. Uh, <laughs> I was totally just drawn towards her, like physically actually pulled in towards her. Yeah. Um, I couldn't control my body. Yeah. I had no control of my mind. Yeah. And uh, I, I don't know what's happening. I, and how did you feel emotionally, Alex? Oh, uh, overwhelmed. I got scared at first. Yep. And I pulled away. Yeah. And then um, we just, I just said, just come here, lie down next to me. I don't know what just happened. And then I went. No, no, no! I want to feel that again to see if it's going to happen again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I said, "Let's let's try see if that happens again." And she was just sitting there, and it went straight back into it. Yeah. And um, like I just I just wanted to hold her, and so we just sat there for about ten minutes or so, and I was just hugging her, and it was like I had no sense of myself at all. Yeah. I was just totally lost in this emotion, in this feeling. Yeah. And it was just so overwhelming. Mm. Some blue. Mm. So yeah, there was <laughs> there was no physicality involved. That's pretty good, isn't it? Oh yeah. It was yeah. <laughs> 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 but there was no physicality involved. Like I couldn't. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and and after a while, what happens in your connection with your soulmate is the, and when I say the physical side, you still feel sexually and physically bound to each other, but it becomes almost unimportant. Like, well. We actually right, so had definitely. sex after that, yeah, yeah. and I said to her, "Like, no offense, babe. Like, that was that was good. <laughs> that was good, but not as good but as that the was original. nothing <laughs> compared to it." <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and that's the thing is that a lot of times uh, when we're then involved in the sex act, we disconnect from this emotional transaction. If you can imagine the sex act occurring while the emotional transaction is occurring, yeah. then you'll get some idea of what it's like to be at one with your soulmate. Yeah, well, there's a lot of emotional errors still there within exactly. the sexuality. So, and yeah. it's the emotional errors that cause that disconnection, you see. Yeah. Yep. Someone else had their question hand up? No? That one all blew you away, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Robert, you want to... This one down here, for Robert, sorry. Thanks, Lee. Just a quick jump back to the body parts. I was at a funeral yesterday and the elderly man had donated all in his entire body. Mm -hmm. and I was just thinking of the implications of that. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking at the funeral, is it loving Is is it loving or not loving? 
I mean, in the, in the natural world, it's loving to give you the thought of us loving to give your body parts away. But mm -hmm. in actual fact, I now see it that it could not could not be loving to yourself, given that your spirit could could end up with that body, staying with that person and that body part. Well, the only way that your spirit would end up staying with a person who has your body part is for you to have an emotional connection to your physical body still. And obviously, if you were progressing on the divine love path, that wouldn't happen. And the, the only time it, you would have to consider whether it's unloving or not is that the person whose body part your part is going into, so let's say they have a, a bad kidney or something and, and your kidney is going into them, there is a certain law of attraction that's created that particular injury in them before your body part was available to them. And by giving them a kidney, there is this, uh, there is this possibility, if you think about it, that you're actually reversing some of that law of attraction to stop them from looking at the emotion. So there is an emotional creation of every single thing that goes wrong with it. And if there's an emotional creation and I then fix the effect of that creation, then when is the cause addressed? Now, I'm perfectly happy with a person giving all of their body parts away, um, but I'm also saying that the people who have those body parts given to them need to start addressing the emotional reasons why that body part failed for them. Does that make sense? And there's always going to be a cause as to why that failed. And so that's the only ethical thing you would have to do with that. But that's a bit off topic. So we'll go back to the soulmate topic, please. We'll go to Pete um, next. AJ, yeah, I've had that experience that... Um, Alex? Alex has had with a man I was in relationship with some years ago. Yep. Quite a lot of times or four times or something. And it was just amazing. Like we just felt so at one and we wasn't during sex or anything. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm pretty sure he wasn't my soulmate. Is that still possible with... Um, yes, it is still possible. Yeah. And, I, and I'll talk about why. The reason why is that often spirits are attracted to us under certain conditions who themselves want to have a relationship in the spirit world. And what they do is they use our relationship to consummate, consummate their relationship. All right? We, had a, uh, we were up at Mackay recently and a lady came up to us and talked to us about this happening to her. And it's happened to many, many people, of course. And do you understand what I mean by this? I could have an emotion as a male that I'm a bit overbearing, a bit controlling. Um, I view women sort of in a... I'm sort of like a, a bit of a power freak with women, let's say, and so forth. And that's going to attract a man who is in the same condition in the spirit world, who's earthbound, to connect with me, to use me to connect with women who he wants to treat the same way. Does that make sense? And there could be a woman on the other end, connected to another lady on earth, who has a feeling of, oh, she wants to be dominated a bit by men, you know, wants to be, like, secure, feel secure, that's her hook, but she might feel like she gets sexually turned on when the man's a bit dominant, do you know what I mean? And so the two of them can connect with each other. And now these two may meet up in the spirit world and because they're in different locations in spirit, usually in the first sphere in different locations, they use the people to connect with each other sexually and, uh, and emotionally. So it may not be a sexual connection, it may be an emotional connection. And what often can occur then is this person gives to this person the same kind of feeling as what Alex was describing. Does that make sense? And this person gives to this person the same kind of feeling. And so now they think, oh, we must be together. We're meant to be together and everything. And then three months later, they realise that actually they're not meant to be together. And it all happened. And, mo and this lady, after a while, understood what was happening. And she, she could feel the spirit with her. And the spirit that was with her doing it was a woman spirit who had been in a, imprisoned, interned in a camp in the Second World War in an Italian prison camp, I think it was, in the Second World War, and the man who uh, she was connecting to through the partner was the man who actually was a guard who had sex with her when she was a prison, in prison in the war. And they entered this sort of abusive relationship, and, uh, which they then used people on earth to carry out. 
Like even though that experience felt so loving and positive, it didn't feel like... The truth is you can connect emotionally to, to any person on the planet, right? And so that doesn't mean that they're soulmates necessarily, does it? The key with the soulmate connection is that it's going to be a sexual connection as well as an emotional connection, as well as many other connections will occur as well. And you will know the difference between the two when you feel it. Um, but how do you know he wasn't your soulmate? Well, he's left in with another woman. So? <laughs> he's not my soulmate, is he? <laughs> Why don't you feel he's your soulmate, Arisa? Because he's with another woman? Um, I had some judgment about him. Okay, let's talk about the judgment. What was the judgment you had? It's all right to be he's honest. He's a bit goofy and... Okay. He wasn't my ideal idea of a man. And yes, and this is the stuff I want to talk to you about. And there was some dark, dark stuff in his childhood I felt quite um, that uncomfortable with. You felt repulsed Repulsed, by. yeah. yeah. Yes. <coughs> yep. Can you see why I want to talk to you about all that? Because he could have been your soulmate. He could have been. Hmm. <laughs> And you rejected your soulmate because your judgment of goofiness and your judgment of childhood issues and your judgment... It's quite that simple to reject your soulmate. See, every rejection of our soulmate is based upon emotional injuries. And if you think about it, what you're relating is a lot of emotional injury-based reasons as to why you rejected somebody. So, yeah, he could have been your soulmate. And this is also a truth that many of you have met your soulmates but you just didn't know it at the time, right? Because you didn't want to know it at the time because it wasn't your ideal version of your soulmate. Does that make sense? And this is something we need to really address, emotionally address, and this is why I want to get into the emotional discussion after I've, phys after I've discussed the technicals, is because if we do not address those issues, you can be brought face to face with your soulmate and not know, right? And walk away from them and think someone totally different is your soulmate because you don't want to address the emotional issues inside of yourself as the reason why you rejected them. So this is why it's so important to deal with the emotions, right? Because yes, some people's soulmates appear goofy, right? And some people's soulmates don't appear very intelligent at all. And some people's soulmates feel actually are just downright nasty because every single person on the planet has one. Has a soulmate, I mean. So, you know, are there nasty people on the earth? Yes. yes. So one of them might be your soulmate. <laughs> you know? Can you see how if we judge things through sort of the physical and also through our preconceptions usually about ideals with, uh, with relation to parents, then what happens is we often reject our own soulmate in the process. Yep. And this is why it's very important to work through these issues. Does that make sense? It's a good question. Good question. Now, so the two of us have incarnated. We're now on the planet somewhere and barring any injury, in other words, you know, someone passed because they got run over by a truck or whatever, we're still here on the planet probably somewhere, right? So, how do we find them from a technical point of view? What you do is you look through the phone book and you just... You know, <laughs> it's not like that at all, right? Trust me, I, I, I have tried some really maniacal ways of finding this. <laughs> uh, by the way, looking through my phone book wasn't one of them, but <laughs> and I just want to state that categorically. But because I've longed for my soulmate most of my life, I've had this like, feeling of missing her most of my life, and so I've done some very strange things. <laughs> right? Looking for my soulmate. Until I gave up the look. I needed to give up the looking. 
And the reason why I was looking was because I was unwilling to deal with my grief associated with the issue. Does everyone follow that? I was looking so that I could avoid a heap of grief. And once I realised that and I just stopped looking and started focusing on feeling my grief, right, once I started focusing on really feeling the grief I felt, then I, started, I could start feeling my soulmate and her characteristics and her personality again and all of those other things I started to feel. It wasn't until then. Before then, what I was doing was doing lots of different things and I think the air conditions need to go back on again if we can do that. Um, the, uh, um, I was doing lots of different things um, to try and find my soulmate. Shall I mention a few? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, might as well give everyone a bit more fodder for the internet. <laughs> uh, well, one of the things I did was um, I just thought, my soulmate's somewhere in the Sunshine Coast. Right? And so what I did was I did a drive-by <coughs> of the Sunshine Coast. <laughs> trusting my feelings, trying to trust my feelings, right? So I was going up, trust my feelings, no, trust my feelings. And then I was getting up near Gympie and I'm going, whoa. I'm just like, <laughs> you know, and so I was really, no, this is Rev I was like, and ironically, my soulmate's parents lived in Gympie. But I didn't know it at the time. And so I was driving up and then I saw Mary River. And, I, and then I started really, and then I, all of a sudden I had huge amounts of emotions. I had to pull over on the side of the road and have a cry actually. Um, but, and so I thought, something about up here. There's something about up here. Um, but, that, bearing that in mind, I thought, no, nah, she'd like the beach. So this is my intellectual thing going now. <laughs> and lo and behold, Mary does love the beach. But anyway, um, she'd like the beach. She, she must be down somewhere along the coast. So I'd drive along the coast. You know, then a coast road, you know, from, from Mooloolaba right up to whatever. I'm like, oh, I get a bit of a hook into Coolum Beach. You know, so I stay there for five days. <laughs> These are crazy things that I've done. Like, stay there for five days. Did I find her? No. Guess where she was at the time? Lebanon. In Lebanon. Like, <laughs> how am I going to find her there? Like, anyway, so yeah, impossible for me to do that. So I was just, all I was doing really was just avoiding some stuff. And once I started uh, focusing on what I was avoiding, I could understand why I was avoiding it uh, because there was lots of grief and I had to feel lots of grief. And one of the things I learned was that if actually you hold on to your grief and you ne you're looking for your soulmate in order to avoid a heap of grief, you're not going to find your soulmate under those conditions. Because right? you need to feel this grief and release it before your soulmate will be drawn to you. Otherwise, what's happening? Your soulmate's got this job, right? To cheer you up. Does that feel very attractive to you? Like, to have a job before they even met you? <laughs> like, that, they're going, that you're going to have to be cheered up by them. No, it doesn't feel very attractive, does it? So, so you, you want to release those emotions. And, and anyway, it took me a lot of times, a lot of uh, my life to realise all of these things. And so sometimes what I would do is I'd get to a group like this and I'd say, um, do any of you think that uh, you might know my soulmate? <laughs> <laughs> 20 people would put up their hands and, like, and have 20 different answers, right? And then, of course, sometimes a medium would come along and say, oh, your soulmate's this person. So, you know me, like, I'd go up and find out. <laughs> so if that person was, like, somewhere overseas, I'd go over there and check it out. And, of course, that didn't work very well either um, because I'd meet them and go, no, this person's not my soulmate at all. <laughs> so, um, so there we go. And in the end, um, I gave up all of that gave up all of that searching and all of that and just concentrate on feeling my grief. And when I started concentrating on feeling my grief, I could feel my soulmate. And I could even feel, um, ironically, that she was overseas at the time. So I could feel that. I didn't know where overseas. I could just feel she wasn't in Australia once I started allowing myself to feel. And, uh, and then um, I could feel, actually, there was one time that I felt very distressed about my soulmate. And I actually went back to Coolum Beach, of all places, and uh, hired another week of, uh, uh, of a, uh, what do you call it, apartment, 
and spent the whole week crying in the apartment. <laughs> Not a very good use of a Coolum Beach apartment, by the way. Uh, the beach is a far better location. But um, what I'm saying is that I just spent the whole week there because I was in so much turmoil emotionally because I could feel that my soulmate was in turmoil and I felt that, we, that the decision she was making that week somehow related to our lives together. And we found out afterwards that the decision she was making was she was, she was thinking of marrying somebody overseas. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I felt the turmoil of that. And then by the end of the week, I realised that it was all over. And the irony was, by the end of the week, she was coming home to Australia. And so things change quite rapidly when you feel things. Nina? Do you have the mic down here? Sorry, Pete. So if I've understood this discussion correctly, you feeling that grief in Kula may have affected Mary's decision not to go ahead with that marriage. Is totally. That yeah. Totally. The thing you need to understand, and we'll talk about this more and more, the thing you need to understand is that every single emotion you feel <coughs> and release inside of yourself, your soulmate will have an effect, it will have an effect on them. Right, so it's very, very powerful emotionally. Yeah. Actually, that, that was a little bit along the lines of my question. Mm -hmm. Given that um, more people are, are fi <coughs> finding out about the divine love path mm -hmm. and that there is that um, strong magnetic attraction between the two halves, is, is the likelihood for the people in the room here, uh, myself included, mm -hmm. that um, as, as we continue um, to work with our emotions, the, the, our soulmate will actually discover and find the divine love path also. Yep. Uh, since we've got, uh, we've got that um, tendency to have similar interests. Yep. And, and it's likely, but it's not necessarily true. You see, a, lo a lot of times what we have is a lot of judgments about people. And, and to be frank with you, many of you have judgments about people that are not on the divine love path, right? Can you feel those judgments? Some of you have them, right? And so what happens is that oftentimes our soulmate might not be on the divine love path until we work through those judgments. Do you follow me? Until we actually work our way through a lot of those emotions that cause us to think, oh, the person I'm with can't be my soulmate because they don't, they're not attracted to the divine love path. That is a judgment and that is not necessarily true. They might be your soulmate and it's just that you're in a place of judgment about the divine love path. Does that make sense? When you work your way through the divine love path emotionally, you'll get to a point where you no longer judge anybody who's not on the path as well, including your potential soulmate. All right? So, so be very, very careful of this trying to preempt, oh, I'm on the path, so my soulmate must be on the path. That kind of thing. Like, I'm a musician, so my soulmate must be a musician. It's the same thing. I'm, you know, whatever. I'm a builder, so my soulmate's got to be one. <laughs> you know, when you start thinking about some of the purposes we could take that, we could take it to pretty weird places, couldn't we, right? And so in the end, what we need to do is realise that everything that I have within me that's a judgement of something outside of me, it's going to prevent me from being open to my soulmate anyway. Right? So it's so important to work on yourself in this discussion. Gent? So in fact, when I met Graham, um, it wasn't until we started to release lots of our individual, you know, like our the unique emotional injuries. Injury, yep. injuries that I've actually come to the realisation of just how similar we are. Yep. But that wasn't my question. My question is about prayer. Yep. So what is appropriate prayer in regarding to our soulmate in that the way in which we pray perhaps comes from, can come from our soul injuries. Sorry, so, sorry. Please oh. send me my soulmate. Please send me my soulmate. <laughs> I don't know if that's going to have much effect, what do you reckon? Yeah. Right. So, um, so then on. the question is, uh, after that, yeah. um, praying for your soulmate then would affect the other half? 
praying for anybody else affects them. So you can pray for them, but you've got to look at what's your motive. Remember, when it comes to prayer, our motive must be pure. And if I have a motive that I want my... Please, you know, pray for my soulmate every night because my motive is I want to meet her. <laughs> then how pure is this motive? No, it's not that pure, really, is it? It's quite selfish. So when we pray for anybody, we don't want to pray for them from a selfish place. We want to play, pray for them from the place of love, which is a very different place. So um, just bear that in mind when you're praying for your soulmate. You know, screaming to God at the top of your lungs, please give me my soulmate now, is not probably going to arrive <laughs> you know, anytime shortly. And, and, and pleading with God to send you your soulmate because you can't bear your life as it is, is definitely not going to result in you receiving your soulmate shortly. Because you need to deal with the emotional injuries we have. And when we deal with the emotional injuries truthfully, that automatically attracts the soul, the other half of the soul. Does that make sense? Like, there's an automatic attraction that occurs as a result of that. If we go, oh, yep, come down here and then up to there. Hi. Okay. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. if, if you're selfish, mm -hmm. which I am. And I am too. Yeah, I mean, how can you get out of us from a selfish point of view? And what about just desiring your, your soulmate? How selfish is that? Um, yeah, this is a very good point, And I want to raise this in the whole discussion about the law of desire. Because most people think desire is selfish. And it no, is. I don't think it is. No? Because if that's what our soul is, our desires and emotions, then how can it be selfish? It's not. So let's define selfishness. Selfishness is when I want somebody else to help me suppress one of my emotions. I do a good enough job of that by myself. Okay. <laughs> but can you see the, my definition of selfishness? I want somebody else to help me suppress one of my own emotions. Now, when I'm going, please give me my soulmate because I'm lonely, what am I saying? I'm wanting my soulmate to help me suppress the emotion of loneliness that's inside of my soul. So is that a selfish motive? Yes. So even though I think I'm desirous in that state of not being lonely, it's actually an avoidance of one of my own emotions and therefore it's a selfish condition. Now those kind of selfish acts won't be heard by God and also don't you know, obviously not, are very harmful if you got satisfied in that state. Because what would happen is your soulmate would come along and you'd no longer feel lonely, but there's all this loneliness still within you. Does that make sense? You're never going to become at one with God now because you, you're ignoring all this loneliness within you. And of, obviously the loneliness will attract an event to trigger it, which may even involve your soulmate. All right? So what if your soulmate passes and then you're back to being lonely again? Does that make sense? Um, the question that I have a couple around this. Um, if you think you know who your soulmate is mm -hmm. and like I mm -hmm. tested with kinesiology mm -hmm. as to who I believed it was, mm -hmm. does that mean it is? <laughs> <laughs> um, I had a whole discussion, I don't know if it's actually on the net, but I had a whole discussion about kinesiology and the influences that are available on you when you're performing kinesiology. And there are quite a lot of external influence upon you when you're doing kinesiology. Because you've got your own emotional state, you've got the state of any spirit with you, which can influence your emotional state. You've got also the state of the tester, whoever is testing. And if it's you, then it's even more influence on the state. Does that make sense? So there are actually lots of things involved with kinesiology that while kinesiology be used as a tool to determine truth, if you come to depend on it when you're in an emotional condition that's not yet at one with God, you'll find that there will be some errors in the testing. Okay. All right? So what I'm saying as a result is that yet, while it's an interesting thing that you tested it and it came out to be true, it may not in the end be true. All right? And so in the end, you've still got to deal with the emotional reason why you wanted to test it. Does that make sense? 
And, and this is where a lot of people with things like kinesiology and these tools, even the tool of mediumship, right? The tool of mediumship is a tool that allows the spirit to communicate to you and tell you all sorts of information. If you want to use it to avoid an emotion, you can. And many of us who are trying to test for our soulmate or test for other things are just in that process avoiding an emotion. Does that make sense? Avoiding an emotion that I don't really believe it to be true. Oh, yeah, it is true. Oh, I've got to accept it then. But there's still an emotion inside that says, I don't believe it to be true, sitting in there that needs to come out. Does that make sense? For me, it made perfect sense. Okay. Absolutely perfect, perfect sense. sense. Yep. Which, of course, it would do if you tested it to be true. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I wish you would just tell us all the name of our soulmate exactly. and where they are. Exactly. Now when we're going to be with them. Now we're getting to the What point. our current partners will be doing. Okay. Will they be happy when okay. we go with our soulmate? So, so what was the first one? The name? You wanted a name? <laughs> what was the next one? The timing? You wanted the timing? What was the next one? Yeah, yeah well, let's, might as well go for the whole lot while we're at it, right? And... and uh, can you see that in doing that, we're often avoiding living in truth in our current situation? You see, you see what, what happens a lot of the times is that many of you, for example, know for certain you're not with your soulmate, right? But what do you finish up doing? Stay with the person you're with until you meet your soulmate. That's what you think, right? Uh-uh. You're going to have to confront it a lot more than that. If you know the person you're with is not your soulmate, then how can you remain with them if the soulmate part of your side is open? The soulmate part of your soul is open. You won't be able to remain with them. So that's telling me that your soulmate part of your soul is not open. Unless it's closed. They might still be. Ah. You know, there's, still a possibility. there's no might after a while. You know whether the person you're with is not or is. And if you know they're not, then why are you still with them? You're only still with them because of security and other issues, right? Worry about finances, worry about children, worry about all emotional issues which need to be addressed. So address them. Does that make sense? Don't run away from them. We'll talk about this more in the second half of our discussion because it's so important to understand. So please understand that I'm not telling you you've got to all just leave your partners and be single. Right? So I'm not saying that, and anybody on the internet that says that, I'm not saying that. But what I am saying that you do need to address the emotional reasons inside of yourself as to why the soulmate part of your soul is not open. And there will be lots of reasons which we shall discuss that cause that to be closed. Yeah? We can go over here and then over to Mary. AJ, it's been interesting listening, but it sounds like everybody thinks that when they meet their soulmate, it's going to be perfect happiness and bliss. Yeah, well and I don't think people realise just how difficult it is going to be. No. Um, I think there's a, an erroneous idea there that if I meet my soulmate, everything becomes one and easier. And, and I know for me personally that is not true. Well, yeah, when you think about it... Um if it takes to the 22nd sphere to become at one with your soulmate, don't you think that there's going to be quite a lot to deal with? So, if you can become at one with God by the 8th sphere... <laughs> and it takes another 14 to become at one with your soulmate, don't you think there's going to be a fair bit to deal with? Yeah. So, so all of us that have this utopian viewpoint of meet your soulmate happy ever after, really we've got rocks in our heads, right? <laughs> because that's not true. That's not how it's going to happen at all. You, you're dead right. It's not how it's going to happen at all. Our soulmate is going to be our perfect, sympathetic, like our perfect partner, but only once we work through lots of, not only issues of emotional injury, because remember our emotional injuries by the time we hit the eighth sphere, are gone. So what does that tell me? I become at one with my soulmate way, way up here in the 22nd. By the time I get to the eighth sphere, my emotional injuries are gone. So what am I learning here? There's obviously got to be lots of truths between the soulmate's halves that I've still got to absorb. Can you see that? And they won't be emotional injuries. They'll actually be other things. 
truths that you will absorb as you grow closer to God that will pull you together with your, into your soulmate. Right? So the truth is that there is going to be lots of stuff confronted, not just emotional injuries. Now obviously, confronting emotional injuries from the seventh sphere down, including the seventh sphere, is a very difficult task and that's the task that we don't enjoy very much, right? So, you know, seventh, up and progress from there to the top of the seventh sphere is some of the hardest progress you'll make. The reason why it's hardest because is because there's all this error-based painful feelings to release that are stored within your soul. Does that make sense? So it's going to be quite difficult. But once you make the transition into at one with God, at this point you're at one with God, right, in the eighth sphere, then obviously from then on you're just learning, the, having the pleasure of, I should say, learning new truth. But doesn't that tell you there's quite a lot of truth that is going to have to be learnt too? You'll enjoy it then, that's the beauty of it. And if both of you hit the at one stage, obviously your joy in relationship is going to be quite intense, right? As you're progressing through those things because there's no longer emotional injuries or emotional baggage to influence the relationship between yourself and your soulmate. But there is still lots to learn that will keep you away from being at one with each other until you learn it. Does that make sense? So, yep, forget about the old idea, ideal partner type thing in terms of an injury-based uh, viewpoint of it because it's actually quite a lot of error in that. And by the way, there's quite a lot of expectation in that, yeah. right, that this person will meet. Basically what you're saying is this person is going to meet all of my emotional injuries perfectly. Is that what you want? Because <laughs> if that's what you want, then I'd suggest you don't follow the divine love path at all and go and find another path that that, 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 that happens on, right? Because on the divine love path, what happens is we are concerned about getting into and releasing all of our emotional injuries so that we don't have any injuries. That's why the, that's the whole path, right? And as we progress on that path, then we're not interested in finding a person that meets all of my injuries. We're now interested in finding a person who has integrity, character, truth, and all these other things, of course, that, that will allow us to grow and them to continue growing. And if they're our soulmate, we'll just keep growing together. Yeah. Uh, Mary, you wanted to say? Oh, Dallin, I was just trying to uh, quietly tell you it was 2.30. <laughs> 2.30, is it? Yeah. Oh, okay. So I've got a half an hour before uh, we... Can I say, though, that I think that there's something that happens when soulmates meet. Because the law of attraction is so intense, it actually triggers your emotional injuries even more. Yeah. 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 So, so when you first meet your soulmate, you will often have intense negative emotional events occur. And when I say intensely negative, you think it's intense now? you wait till you meet your soulmate, it gets intense then, right? Because, because if you're pulling together emotionally and there's all these emotional injuries, things get triggered quite a lot. And, and if Mary's okay with it, I'll talk about some of the things that got triggered between us uh, in the later half of the talk. Yeah? Linda? Um, I had an experience some time ago where I... Um, released some grief and I was sitting on the end of my bed and just barely relaxed and looking in the mirror and thinking about who my soulmate might be and I saw half of my face, his face in the other half of mine mm -hmm. and um, could that be spirit influence or like still emotional injuries or like I know, well I do know this person but so I saw that half and I was like Okay, it let's address this issue. Any time you have a metaphysical interaction, there is always the danger of there being a spirit involved. So any single time you're looking for any metaphysical confirmation of your soulmate, including mediumship, kinesiology, visions, images, dreams, and so forth, there always could be a spirit involved in this process who is actually not your soulmate, right? And who doesn't want to point out your soulmate. <coughs> the only way you're going to find out is as you grow in love, in divine love. 
That's the only way you're going to find out in the end, really, isn't it? Now, in the spirit world, it's a little easier to find out than it is here. Because in the spirit world, even on the natural love path, by the time you get to the fifth sphere of the spirit world, you start noticing this unique energetic connection that seems to go off into the distance to somebody at the other end if you haven't recognised it before. And it's a unique connection. It's like, oh, remember in the spirit world I've been telling you, every connection has colours. So whatever emotion is that I'm feeling has all colours associated with it. So there's this unique colour that connects you between you and your soulmate, right? And that unique colour you start noticing coming out of you and going somewhere. And so all you need to do to find your soulmate is to trace the colour. Right? And that will lead you to a person that you'll look at and go... Hmm. Like, I've got no idea why I've got this connection to that person and, and walk off. That's what most of them do initially. Right? Because they haven't had a soulmate longing before then and they're just noticing the colour, right? And so it, when you have a soulmate longing, it draws you straight away. But when, when you have just noticing the metaphysical, it draws you to the person, you examine the person, you go, hmm, hmm I don't know why, I'm inter why, the, you know, why there's this connection between us. I'll find out at some point later. And off you go doing something else. Right? And this is a problem with all metaphysical type manifestation, manifestations is there can always be some kind of spirit transaction involved. My suggestion is to deal with the emotions. And this is why we want to have the second half of this discussion of what kind of emotions cause the soulmate half of your soul to open. And then notice what happens when you start opening that part of your soul. Because, because you opening that part of your soul will draw your soulmate to you, right? So, in other words, it's not going to be someone necessarily that you think you should have. It's going to be something that is drawn to you because your part of the soul is open. This is why it's so important to focus on your emotional injuries regarding the opposite gender or if you have a same-sex attraction to the same gender. You need to deal with those emotional injuries. Does that make sense? So, so any metaphysical thing, always look upon with suspicion. I've had like, I've had five different mediums tell me five different soulmates. And none of them got it right, by the way. Yeah, I wasn't thinking about it at the time, I don't think. Like I was just... Yep. It, but you were thinking about who, yeah, who and is then, my soulmate. Then it just kind you of, were sitting down, it, concentrating, looking in the mirror, thinking, who is my soulmate? Um, so who's not, I don't know, I was just looking in the mirror because that's right. right near my bed and, and then it just kind of changed. It actually freaked me out because I was like, no, no, you know, I didn't want to see that but then it was a bit of a... Okay. So, yeah, I did. But can you see how that could draw a spirit into the, yeah. into the mix? Yeah. Just you th feeling about the issue yeah. straight away draws anybody who... into the mix. Yeah, yeah. And that person can easily give you a vision... And before you know it, you... So, so I'm not saying don't trust it. What I'm saying is, okay, that happened. Mm. Let yourself know that happened. But now don't feel it about it. The, um, feel yeah. about it. Yeah. Emotionally feel about it. Yeah. So what's the emotions there about it? Because oh, it's someone so in your much. past, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, an ex, but he kind of moved on. And okay. Then, yeah. And so, huh. so what's that telling you? There's still quite a lot of emotions yeah. with this ex that you mm. need to address. Mm. I would address them. Go yeah, ahead and address I, it them. Keeps, there's a lot of stuff just happening all the time. Yeah. So. Don't avoid those emotions. Address them. Mm. Yeah. What if this person is your soulmate? Address mm. that. How are you going I don't to really it? like him. <laughs> okay. Okay. So feel about that. Let yourself I don't feel think it. I do. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So let yourself feel about that. And let yourself go through the emotional experience of that. So understand that all of these metaphysical experiences, whether they are agreement of, a, of a, whether they are true about a soulmate or untrue, are all law of attraction events that we need to work through an emotion about. Does that make sense? So when, when uh, one of the mediums told me that my soulmate was somebody overseas and I go over there as a part of a trip and I decide to pull, call in and I meet the person and they're, not, and they're not my soulmate, I can feel that, what do I feel? Well, there was a feeling of somebody telling me an untruth 
you know, like a spirit telling me an untruth. I can't trust spirits. There was a feeling of, do you know what I mean? There was quite a few feelings associated with that. You know, disappointment that, oh, I thought I was going to meet my soulmate and I didn't. And, you know, there's all sorts of different emotions involved in a process like that. So let yourself feel them. They are all things that need to be healed and released. Yep. Okay. Um, uh, if we go, I don't think you've asked a question in Napoli, have you so far? You have? All of you have. So let's start with Natalie and work our way backwards. Would a celestial spirit tell you who your soulmate is? Uh, not always, no. In fact, most celestial spirits will try to help you deal with the emotional reason why you can't work it out for yourself. So what, is, what, what does a celestial spirit want you to do? A celestial spirit wants you to work through all of your own blockages towards God. Once all of those blockages are released and you become closer and closer to God, you'll come closer and closer to yourself. You'll become a lot more self-reliant and you'll know in yourself when you meet your soulmate. That's what a celestial spirit wants you to do. So is a celestial, you know, when you say, oh, who's my soulmate? The celestial spirit says Mary. Like, like, is that a celestial spirit, do you think, maybe? Well, I was doing some channeling about myself. Mm -hmm. I had a feeling that my husband was my soulmate. Mm -hmm. I wanted it confirmed. Mm -hmm. And I, was, I believed I was talking to my spirit guides at the time. Mm -hmm. And they said, yes, but you already knew this. Mm -hmm. So I... Did you? Yeah. <laughs> so why did you ask? I wanted to be sure. <laughs> why? Because I had doubt. No, 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 no. See, doubt's a good excuse to get away from <laughs> other emotions. What are the real emotions? Well, they, I asked why, why I doubted and they said it was because I didn't feel that I deserved that kind of love from a person and that I had longed for it for a long time. Yeah. And I didn't feel I was deserving of it. So yeah. Can you see, though, that with your relationship with your husband, you are you know, not allowing yourself to be open, not allowing yourself to be vulnerable, not allowing yourself to actually connect? Can you see that? Like, can you see the previous injuries from previous relationships have caused you to block off to the male? Can yeah. you see that? So the question really that I would ask you is, in, you're in a relationship, you're married in a relationship, why aren't you opening to this man? Because your question is actually about avoiding that emotion. That can you see the relationship? Yep. You're avoiding the emotions of opening up to the man because you think maybe he's not my soulmate. If you think maybe he's not my soulmate, why are you with him? You need to allow yourself to open up to this man and discover the process of whether he is your soulmate or not. Does that make sense? You're in the relationship. Your law of attraction has brought you this relationship, right? And you thought that he might be your soulmate. So why aren't you opening to him? I have no idea. Yeah, <laughs> that's the crux of the issue. Can you, can you see? Yes. That's the emotion you need to go for. What's, what emotionally is causing you to not be open to this man? So then in that case, if I was to ask for somebody on so, someone else's behalf, if I was channeling and I was to ask about someone else's soulmate, I would not necessarily receive the correct information either. No, that's right. Okay. Yeah. And the tr this is the trouble is that it's our own emotional injuries that affect all communication with the spirit world until we're at one with God. Right? So you will actually be able to get things wrong even as a medium and, and still get things wrong even though you're convinced that they weren't wrong. Because a lot of our conviction comes from emotional injuries about a certain set of circumstances or events. In your case here, what, what's happening is you're avoiding total openness and vulnerability towards your partner. Right? So if you suspected he was your soulmate up till now, why haven't you just gone for it? There's got to be a reason. I don't understand what you mean when you say Why that haven't you just gone for total openness and total vulnerability and total honesty and total everything with this partner? I've just tried doing some of that this week. Okay, that's good. <laughs> and that's what you need to let yourself do. Because when you do that, you'll quickly find whether the person's your partner or your soulmate or not. Okay. Yeah. And you won't need to then ask the question. Sure. Yeah. You see, most of our questions are governed by emotional injuries. Can you see that? Fears, you know, anger even, sadness, grief, shame. A lot of our questions are all based around those injuries. If we allow ourselves to even examine why, what kind of question we're asking, 
and go deeper into it, we'll often find the answer is not related to the thing we thought it was, but rather an emotional injury that blocks me to doing something in my own development. So often we ask the question, is this person my soulmate? Because we want to avoid having an open, honest and truthful relationship with this person until we know. Can you see that? Right? You either know or you don't know. If you don't know, why are you with them? If you do know, like if you don't know, you might decide, oh, I'm going to be with them for security or I'm going to be with them for, you know, whatever issues that we might have. Why are you deciding to stay in a relationship for security? Can you see that's a compromise? Why is, you, can you see that? Like, so allow yourself to investigate this. Katie, you had a question? Oh, yes. Uh, can we wait for a mic there? Yeah. One around here somewhere? Just behind you. Hello. <laughs> uh, my question is, at the time of uh, God's creation of a, um, a soul, mm -hmm. male and, and female, masculine and feminine together, mm -hmm. um, that entity, uh, as created by God, has free will. The single entity, yep. Yes. Okay. So, at that point of having... Uh, uh, one could say almost divine free will uh, or pure free will where we're acting together without emotional injuries because of that at the point of creation. Can I say though that it's not conscious that it has free will? All right. And it's, yet, and it, yet has it has free will but it, it, it ha doesn't know how to express it. Yeah. So um, before you mention that there is personality or individuality at the time of, of creation. Uh, the two are different. All right. Personality is something that God imbuilds into the soul, yes. which we can also develop further. But individuality can, uh, individualization can only happen through at the split through the incarnation process. Yes. All right. Yep. So if if the soul is relatively uh, free of emotional injuries at the time that it's complete, yes, before incarnation, it is completely free of yes. emotional injuries. And so. Why would the soul at that point not just praise and glorify uh, the Father? Because it, it hasn't come to become aware of itself yet, so it can't even know to do that. I see. But the it does have it, it does have free will at that point yeah, in order it, to exercise free will. But to exercise free will, you have to become an individual. You have to actually know that you've got it. You see, yeah. when we when we were created as uh, as souls in this original pristine state. We were not aware that we had free will, even though we had it. And we were not aware of our own, we didn't have any awareness of even ourselves, even though at some point in the future we would become aware of ourselves. So in this state, you could think of it like a soul with person, like a, person, a personality and a single entity, but without any self-awareness. And it's the process of incarnation that creates the self-awareness. Unfortunately, it's also the process of incarnation onto the planet at the moment in its current condition that creates all of our emotional injuries. Yes, and right. degrades awareness. And degrades awareness yes. um, to a degree. Yeah. But we become aware that we are an individual. So the process of individualization is completed by our incarnation. Right. But unfortunately, our own self-awareness of a lot of other issues often gets harmed yeah. because of the emotional injuries. The way God created this part of it, this part down, the earth if you like, is that God created this actually in one, in, in sometime in the future, this will be the case, where people will incarnate onto the earth in complete awareness, yes. in the sense that everyone on here on earth will not be preventing awareness. So these little baby souls, if you could think of them that way, will come to the earth. They still won't have any experience because it's our life that creates experience but they will begin to have awareness at a much, much younger age. Yes, so the, the, the level of emotional injury will diminish quite dramatically in that period. Yes, and yeah. that will diminish by us, by us, dealing with our emotional injuries, yes. which means that when we come together and, and get pregnant, our child will have far less injuries, so yes. therefore more awareness as yes. a, and more rapid awareness of development. Yes, Yep. so humanity will be... Um, at well, that point, freer and closer to the divine. Yeah, it'll be, let's, let's use the term evolve yes. quite rapidly. Yeah. So this is why this period of time, and from a metaphysical perspective, and you, all of you have heard these things, all of you have interested in channeling and whatever, 
have heard all of this, like this is the time of change. This is the time where the whole planet's going to go through this huge change and all that's going to say. How it's going to go through this change is by groups of people like yourself getting into an estate where you're releasing your emotional injuries. So the, those emotional injuries, the next generation of people that incarnate will have less injuries. And as a result of those less injuries, have more awareness of all of these different things that we're now talking about in our 30s, 40s or 50s, they'll be talking about when they're 10 or 5 at school. Right? And then the next generation after that, we won't even need to talk about it. Because by the time they're 5, they'll be doing it. <laughs> right? So they won't even need to talk about it, let alone you know, try to practice it. So many of, many of us at the moment are developing our mediumship skills or developing our other skills, right? Well, once all this change occurs, a five-year-old, they'll say, you had to develop your... <laughs> what do you mean, develop? Like, they'll, they'll look at all this material that AJ did, you know, mediumship session one, mediumship and healing session two, and they go, why did he do all of that for? Because like, you know, they will have those things automatically occurring because of the emotions that have been released generationally, those things will just be automatically present. So the problem that we face today is that because of the huge suppression of emotion on the planet and the huge, and the huge emotional baggage on the planet, we have actually basically um, controlled and, and suppressed our own development as a human race as a result. And, and as we release these emotional injuries, the process of evolving will become much more rapid. And because of it becoming speeding up much more rapid, things that we learn to do in our own lifetime, a five-year-old would be able to do in the next few generations. Yeah. And we'll be going, boy, I don't know whether I wanted to be born in that generation. <laughs> and it would be lovely to be born into a generation where you're five and doing a lot of these things that we're now do 50 and we still don't know what to do. And, and so, you know, when you, when you allow that to, to see the truth of that, you can see the potential of the human race. Yeah. 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 Thanks, AJ. No worries. Um, if we go back to James there and, and then up the back to Brian. The, the soul at creation and prior to incarnation, does it have awareness of God? No. 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 It, it does have a sense of being, yeah. that, uh, but because it's not conscious of itself, it's not aware of its surroundings. Sure. So while it has a connection to God, it's not aware, self-aware of the connection to God. Does that make sense? Yeah. Can you see the difference between being self-aware of something and actually having it? Mm. Like you can have something and not be aware of it at all. And in this condition, the soul is connected to God but does not have an awareness of its own connection to yes. God. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And we'll go up to that. So how do we um, then have that feeling like I have often had that feeling of a loss of that connection? That comes from your parents' emotional injuries regarding losses of connections in their own lifetime. So, for example, let's say I'm a mother and when I was 15... Sorry, I'm a mother of you, your mother, right? But when I was 15, I had this really good boyfriend, right, that was just really amazing. But when, he, when, it, when I was 18, he just left. And then, because I just felt like I was still in love with him, but eventually, you know, I just sort of got over it and I finished up marrying a man when I was 22. And then I had Paula. Can you see that Paula is going to have the emotion of terrible loss about one particular person inside of Paula? because mum never released that loss. Can you see that? And so Paul is going to feel that like a loss of someone special, like a loss of soulmate type emotion. She's going to feel that like that. And, uh, and we often have that. And by the way, most people through their life have that with God as well. So, so this is why you know, a lot of times we have these feelings that occur on the planet, particularly in, in, in societies where there's mainstream religion. So where either in the Muslim societies or Christian societies or so forth, where there's mainstream religion, most people who, who are born have this terrible sense of a loss of God because the previous generation did the practice of their religion for many years and then sort of many of them gave up on their being God or gave up on this connection with God, which is this terrible sadness about a loss of God. And so we, as a child, will then have this deep sadness about losing God. Right? 
and that generation that that happens generationally emotionally it doesn't mean it's necessarily even in your parents it could be in your grandparents and passed down and never released in your parents for example so this is where in the pageant messages there is a message i think it was written by luke that talked about the multi-generational effects of sin and it's worth having a read of because every single thing that we have inside of us is based on something that was not healed in the previous generation usually including our this thing about god so i'm just trying to figure out when in processing that emotion which has come up a number of times for me yep. the loss of connection with god yeah which came from amon and a man yeah then can you see why that's yeah yes i can yes i can see why so the first human couple had this connection with god and then through their choices lost it and then it felt the effects and the pain of that loss can you see that and that multi-generational emotional injury has been passed down ever since the beginning of their lives to now right. and so every new generation is going to experience that same pain of that loss so how so is that a causal like that's a causal emotion yeah. yes that is a causal emotion that you need to let yourself experience yep. but it keeps coming back so i obviously haven't got to the cause to of the it. cause of it exactly or that it might be just pretty big and you need to do a lot more crying about it it's one of those two yeah so, so you so, just keep trying to go with what comes up well like the key I is to understand what it's about see yeah. a lot of times it's about the loss of god reliance and into self-reliance which is what ammon and a man the first human pair got themselves into and and that emotional injury has been passed down from generation to generation to generation so all of us feel like we have a bit of a hole when it comes to God that as a result of this emotion. See, see we, if we didn't have that, we would be born without the feeling of having a hole when it comes to God sort of thing. We'd have a desire for God because we'd recognise the existence of God much more easily than we do now with our emotional injuries, but we wouldn't have this terrible grief associated with it. Does that make sense? At the moment, many of us have got this terrible grief associated with it which is related to this loss that they experienced. Thanks. Does that make sense? If we go up to Brian up the back, he's had his hand up a fair bit. So. Hey, Jay, this is more about being feeling left out again. Yep. Um, Can I just address this emotionally for you? Oh. Is that all right? Right. Now, as a gay man, what's happening, what's happening is one of the big emotional injuries that you've had from your childhood in particular is this feeling that nobody really understands what it's like to be me. Does that make sense? Yep. yep. And, and because of that, when we talk about this separation of the soul, I'm feeling it that it's immaterial whether male, female, two males, two female. That's how I feel it. But you don't feel it that way. You feel it like, again, he's talking about male, female, women, men. No, not talking, you know, there's the feeling inside of you is this not being recognised as a, as a gay male, right? The key is to go into that because there's a lot of multi, there's a lot of multi-generational error on this planet about those, those emotions. And, and it's sad because, because that gets projected at you. So it's like a barrage now, and this is something many of us who are heterosexual do not understand about homosexual, uh, homosexuality and being homosexual. Being homosexual, right from the time of your incarnation, there is this barrage of judgment coming from society to you. Right from the time of incarnation. It not only comes from your parents, your own parents, right, but it comes from society in general. And it becomes from society in general in lots of different walks of life. It's not just, it's not just like sexuality that's questioned. It's, it's also religion that's questioned. In other words, oh, homosexuals, what do most religions say? It's not godly. Right? God never created that way, so it's not godly. So therefore it's wrong. So there's that, there's that huge projection at any newly incarnated 
child who has this split of a male-male or a female-female split at the soul level, there's this huge projection coming from society and from their own parents right from the time of incarnation that not only affects their gender or the sexu their sexuality and their gender choices, but it also affects their religion, it affects their politics, it affects, their, it affects every single aspect of your life. So many of you don't see heterosexuality as an issue. The reason why is because the, you haven't had a whole lifetime of projections about heterosexuality coming at you. But for every single person who's ha who is a, a part of a gay or a homosexual soul, a, a soul male-male or female-female split, has had this projection from the moment of incarnation. You imagine how that feels. Like that feels terrible. And there's a lot of grief to feel about that from a person who's gay. But there's also a lot to feel about it as heterosexuals. Why do we have this huge judgment like that we continue to project? Right? What's going on inside of us that causes us to have these big projections? Because it's a terrible thing to have your, a part of, you imagine, you imagine for a moment that you grow up, you're 15, 16 years of age, and heterosexuality is questioned and told and said to be ungodlike. How would you be feeling, do you think? Do you think it's an issue then for you? Of course it's an issue then for you. Can you see? So it's very, very important to understand how much damage has happened to every single person who is homosexual on the planet by the people who are heterosexual on the planet. Right? Very important to understand that damage. And so, but my suggestion to yourself, Brian, is to allow yourself to grieve about that damage. Yeah, I, I have done a fair bit since I talked to you last, and one of the things I seem to have become aware of is that I'm, I'm getting some from the spiritual realm as well. Yeah, there's huge projection from the yeah. spiritual realm. You see, many spirits haven't yet released their viewpoints about sexuality. So many spirits in the first, second, and third spheres of the spirit world who are still religious have huge judgment. So if you're mediumistic and a homosexual, that even makes it more, Wacko. like you are, that it makes it even more difficult because you've got now these nasty, angry spirits projecting at you. You know, you shouldn't be gay, what's wrong with you? You know, all these different projections you get from Earth, you get also from the spirit world. But because you're mediumistic, you can just feel it. Like it, it it's, it's not like you can run away into your corner up at Mullaney no. and get away <laughs> from that because these are spirits that follow you from here to there to here to there and everywhere you go. And they are like these oppressive, you know, fundamentalists that are on earth. They will keep barking and grabbing and barking and grabbing at you emotionally until you release the emotion of it. And when you release the emotion of it, that's when you won't feel it anymore. Does that make sense? Yep, thanks. Yep. So if you can allow yourself to just address the emotion of that, that will help quite a lot. But also when you address the emotion of that, you'll find people around you even heterosexuals around you will start recognising their role in the creation, their role in what they created in you. Does that make sense? Yep, that one So you'll have, you have people who you don't even know who are heterosexual saying, boy, you know, I just see how much damage I've projected at homosexual people all my life. And they'll start recognising that. But they won't do that probably until you start releasing the grief that you've been starting to release about that. One of the things I must say to, to all of those of you who are mediumistic, and of course many of you are developing mediumistically quite well, is that spirit projections, once you have your mediumistic ability, are quite often more difficult to deal with than projections from people on earth. And the reason why is that projections from people on earth you can generally get away from in a physical environment, but projections from spirits are very, very difficult to avoid. The only way to get away from a projection from a spirit is to deal with the emotional reason in yourself as to why your, why your soul is receiving it. Does that make sense? That's the only way you can deal with it. So like at the moment I've got millions and millions and millions of spirits projecting at me all this stuff about me being Jesus. 
right? And the only way for me to deal with it is to feel my emotions about it. I can't protect myself from it. I can, you know, if I was on the natural love path, I'd surround myself with white light and do all those other things, you know, that people do. But on the divine love path, I shouldn't protect myself from it. I should just feel what it generates inside of myself because once I release that, it'll have no effect on me. So you'll get to the point where someone's yelling and screaming at you and you'll have no effect at all. You won't feel like yelling and screaming back. You won't feel like hurting them. You'll just look at them maybe even a bit strangely and think, oh, okay, that's the way it's going. You maybe even feel compassion for them because they have this fear that they're working their way through. But you won't feel like really angry and mess, you know, really upset about it. And while I'm on the subject, bearing that in mind, any time you are attacked, if you want to respond in kind or even if you want to defend yourself, you are avoiding an emotional injury. Does that make sense? So let yourself feel about what that emotional injury may be. It's now uh, three o'clock, so uh, that went fast. Time goes fast when you're having fun. <laughs> um, uh, maybe not for you, but it went fast for me anyway. Um, if we come back around a uh, quarter to four, if we can make it about then, and we'll continue this discussion.